we barely got started on Romans chapter 3 last time, and this week we're going to continue it. Now, before we reread Romans 3, I want you to please keep in mind that what Paul is doing, at least for the first few verses of, of Romans 3, is defending Israel's election as God's set-apart people. Romans chapter 3 is only a continuation of chapter 2. There never should have been a chapter break here, as it completely disrupts the flow of Paul's thought pattern. Paul's opening words of chapter 3 are, then what advantage has the Jew? Now this question is what sets the stage for Paul to make the argument that Israel was, is, and shall remain God's set-apart people despite what he may have said in chapter 2. So whatever commonality Jews and Gentiles may share does not diminish Israel's special standing before the Lord. On the other hand, Jehovah set apart people having received uh, and ratified covenants from God that makes them set apart does not so this does not so totally separate them from the rest of humanity that they are considered exempt from the shared fate of the human race they are still liable to sin and therefore to experience God's wrath Throughout this chapter, we see Paul struggling, as we do, to define the place of the law, meaning the law of Moses, <clears throat> within the lives of believers, Jew and Gentile. But the real reason for this struggle is not so much that the law's place in the lives of worshipers of the God of Israel has changed, due to Christ's advent because it hasn't. The reason for the struggle is because the place and purpose of the law within Second Temple Judaism had become corrupted and it was now not being utilized as God had intended. Yeshua's Sermon on the Mount was largely about recovering the true purpose and meaning of the law of Moses. Yeshua was not trying to reform or to recast the law itself. In fact, he stated straight away that not the tiniest speck of the law would change. Till when? Heaven and earth passed away. Rather, he was trying to reform the religion of the Jews, Judaism, that was misusing and misunderstanding the law. In many ways, that's what Paul is trying to do. He is trying to put the law into proper perspective as it was always intended because it had become diluted and subverted and kind of twisted over the centuries since the Babylonian exile, and this was as a result of man-made rules and regulations. Tradition, halakha, had crept in at an ever-increasing rate until finally we hear Yeshua say in Matthew 15, 7 through 9, you hypocrites, Isaiah was right when he prophesied about you. These people honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far away from me. Their worship of me is useless because they teach man-made rules as if they were doctrines. So up to now, in the book of Romans, we find Paul teaching some basic God principles that the Believing Jews of Rome especially should have already known. But their Judaism had distorted these God principles by intertwining them with man-made doctrines such that they had to unlearn much of what they believed. This was before Paul could even teach them the divine truth. 
Ironically, this is precisely the place that we find Christianity in the 21st century. The church is so mixed, God's word with the hundreds of doctrines of men, supplemented, supplemented by the new political correctness of the West, to the point that for the average layman, it is nearly impossible to distinguish, to distinguish truth from error. So it falls to a few individuals to step forward and try to reestablish God's most basic principles by reestablishing God's word. Just as it is, as the only reliable source of truth. And just like what Paul discovered, there is much unlearning that must come about among believers before godly illumination can take place and, and rid us of our false beliefs. Well, let's reread Romans chapter 3. Go to page 1404 if you have a complete Jewish Bible. Romans chapter 3. Romans chapter 3. Then what advantage has the Jew? What's the value of being circumcised? Much in every way. In the first place, the Jews were entrusted with the very words of God. Now, if some of them were unfaithful, so what? Does their faithlessness cancel God's faithfulness? Heaven forbid. God would be true even if everyone were a liar. As the Tanakh says, so that you, God, may be proved right in your words and win the verdict when you are put in trial. Now, if our unrighteousness highlights God's righteousness, what should we say? That God is unrighteous to inflict his anger on us? I'm speaking here the way people commonly do. Heaven forbid. Else how could God judge the world? But, you say, if through my lie, God's truth is enhanced, and it brings him greater glory, then why am I judged merely for being a sinner? Indeed, why not say, as some people slander us by claiming we do say, well, then let us do evil so that good may come of it. Against them, the judgment's a just one. So are we Jews better off? Not entirely. For I have already made the charge that all people, Jews and Gentiles alike, are controlled by sin, as the Tanakh puts it, there is no one righteous, not even one. No one understands. No one seeks God. All have turned away and at the same time become useless. There is no one who shows kindness. Not a single one. Their throats are open graves. They use their tongues to deceive. Viper's venom is under their lips. Their mouths are full of curses and bitterness. Their feet rush to shed blood, and in their ways are ruin and misery, and the way of shalom they do not know. There is no fear of God before their eyes. Moreover, we know that whatever the Torah says, it says to those living within the framework of the Torah, in order that every mouth may be stopped, and the whole world be shown to deserve God's adverse judgment. For in his sight, no one alive will be considered righteous on the ground of legalistic observance of Torah commands. Because what Torah really does is to show people how sinful they are. But now, quite apart from Torah, God's way of making people righteous in his sight has been made clear. Although the Torah and the prophets give their witness to it as well. And it is, and it is a righteousness that comes from God. Through the faithfulness of Yeshua the Messiah to all who continue trusting. It makes no difference whether one is a Jew or a Gentile, since all have sinned and all come short of earning God's praise. By God's grace, without earning it, all are granted the status of being considered righteous before him through the act redeeming us from our enslavement to sin that was accomplished by the Messiah Yeshua. Now God put Yeshua forward as the kapara for sin through his faithfulness in respect to his bloody sacrificial death. This vindicated God's righteousness 
because in his forbearance he had passed over with neither punishment nor remission the sins people had committed in the past and it vindicates his righteousness in the present age by showing that he is righteous himself and is also the one who makes people righteous on the grounds of Yeshua's faithfulness. So what room is there left for boasting? None at all. What kind of Torah excludes it? One that has to do with legalistic observance of rules? No, rather a Torah that has to do with trusting. Therefore, we hold the view that a person comes to be considered righteous by God on the ground of trusting, which has nothing to do with legalistic observance of Torah commandments. Or is God the God of the Jews only? Isn't he also God of the Gentiles? Yes, he is indeed the God of the Gentiles, because as you will admit, God is one. Therefore, he will consider righteous the circumcised on the ground of trusting and the uncircumcised through that same trusting. Now, does it follow that we abolish the Torah by this trusting? Heaven forbid. On the contrary, we confirm Torah. <clears throat> Let me begin by reminding you that what we see here, especially at the opening of this chapter, is Paul speaking in a way that is quite familiar in the Jewish Talmud. Paul debates as a rabbi because he's a rabbi. His method is to present a problem and then argue against a previous ruling in order to arrive at the correct solution. The solution then becomes a doctrine or a regulation. So he begins the argument by asking the question, then what advantage has the Jew? And this refers back to chapter 2, where Paul explains that Jews and Gentiles are equal before God. And rather surprisingly, when it seems as though from everything he has set up to now that the answer to his question would be, well, no advantage, he answers the question much in every way. The Jews' advantage, says Paul, stems from the reality that they have a God-established priority, a preeminence, which in every respect is valuable and it's important. And then Paul begins to explain the most important aspect of this preeminence. They have received and were entrusted to keep and maintain the word of God. No other nation, no other people had received such an honor. Now, when we hear Paul say, that the Jews' advantage is much in every way, we need to take that in a conversational sense and not as a theological absolute. Often I hear pastors or, or Bible teachers say that in the Bible, all means all, 100%. No, it doesn't. In the Bible, the terms all or every means mostly, almost entirely, or the vast majority. That's what it means. All and every are not meant to be precise terms. There will always be exceptions to the rule. And yet, even with your great distraction... Uh, rather distinction is the keepers of God's oracles to mankind, the Jews failed in their obligations. And so Paul acknowledges this failure by asking yet another question in verse 3. He asks, but if Israel was unfaithful, does that lack of faithfulness cancel God's faithfulness towards them? Now that, my friends, is a very volatile question because it involves the issue of whether Israel is still God's special people or has God abandoned them because they broke the covenant. Or in what theology circles, what in theology circles is called supersessionism, replacement theology, due to their rebellion has Israel been replaced by the Gentile church? <clears throat> 
Now, for centuries, including in our day, much of the institutional church answers this question with a resounding, yes, it does. It would have been nice if third church authorities would have just read and taken seriously a couple of more verses. Because in verse 4, Paul answers the question that he had asked this straw man. He says that if some Jews failed by being unfaithful to God, then this certainly does not affect God's faithfulness towards them. I mean, let's be clear that this faithfulness of God has to do with his being faithful to the covenants that he made with Israel. And conversely, Israel's unfaithfulness is based on their not being faithful to those same covenants. So while Israel broke their end of the deal, God kept his, and he continues to keep it. Thus the covenants remain intact and effective, the covenants of Abraham and Moses, not because Israel upheld them, they didn't, it's because God, the guarantor of those covenants, upheld them. Therefore, the advantage that Israel and the Jewish people have always enjoyed over Gentiles continues in force. Gentiles have not superseded Jews as God's covenant people. Gentiles do not have an advantage over Jews. So Paul refutes this straw man's suggestion by saying, heaven forbid an answer to the question of whether God has rescinded his faithfulness to the covenants that he had made with Israel. Now, in Greek, the term heaven forbid is me genuito, me genuito. Literally, it translates to let it not be. However, what we're actually dealing with is a Hebrew idiom, and it gets watered down when it gets expressed in Greek. Now I showed you a little trick a few lessons ago to find out how we can in some cases better understand what the Hebrew thought is behind these Greek words of the New Testament. Now the trick is we go to the Greek Septuagint which is a, a very early translation of the Hebrew Bible of the Old Testament and then we compare that Greek next to the Hebrew of the Old Testament and we can see which Greek word was chosen to translate a particular Hebrew word in the Old Testament. Next, we can investigate exactly what that Hebrew word meant, which tells us how it was meant for the Greek equivalent word to have been taken. Once we know that, we can apply it generally anywhere we find that same Greek word, Old Testament or New Testament. Now in the Septuagint, the Old Testament, it is the Greek words me genuito that are used to translate the Hebrew expression chalala, chalala, chalala is a very passionate, very strong expression of intense negativity. In the Old Testament, halala is often translated to English as a curse on it or away with it. This is why you will see some English translations say, God forbid, or heaven forbid. Because in English, those two terms are intensely negative. But in reality, sorry to tell you, the words God, heaven, and forbid aren't even there. They're not there in the Greek. It is merely an attempt to show just how emphatic of a response that Paul is making. 
And yet, there's one other element. Saying halala is a standard rabbinic response in the Talmud for when one rabbi disagrees with the premise and relig or a religious ruling that another rabbi has established. So what we read is Paul arguing in a familiar standard rabbinical way. Now verse 5 enters us into a fascinating theological whirlpool. And I will confess up front that my recent research has caused me to change my mind on what I used to think this passage was conveying to us. The passage reads, now if our unrighteousness highlights God's righteousness, what should we say? That God is unrighteous to inflict his anger on us? Now along with most other Bible commentators, I used to believe that what is being said as a theological principle is that it is the extreme nature of humanity's lack of righteousness that necessarily demonstrates God's profound righteousness. Thus, says Paul, would God be unrighteous to inflict his anger upon us? To which Paul answers, heaven forbid, if this was true, how could God judge the world? Now the usual theological assumption is that God uses the unrighteousness of us, of mankind, to prove his own righteousness. Let me say it another way. It's regularly assumed that Paul is saying that God more or less allows people to sin in order that he has a means to show the world just how righteous he is. I mean, this is rather standard Christian doctrine. But I don't buy it. Because if God had to allow the wicked things to be done for sin to happen in order to prove his own righteousness, then how can he just turn around and punish man for committing the same sins? I mean, after all, according to this theological rationale, if mankind didn't sin, then God would have a little way to prove his righteousness. Or in another way of thinking, God's righteousness is to be measured relative to man's righteousness. None of this works. <laughs> I mean, to, to me, the entire premise is just wrong-minded. This explains why Paul replies in a typical rabbinic fashion to this straw man's ruling that he disagrees with, heaven forbid. But what's he saying heaven forbid to? He's not replying to whether God is unrighteous to inflict his anger. Rather, he's saying heaven forbid to this entire line of reasoning. That is, it is a false reasoning to think that God's righteousness can only be established in proportion to mankind's sin sinfulness. And he follows up his heaven forbid response by saying, and I'm paraphrasing, that if God has to measure his faithfulness in proportion to mankind's unfaithfulness, how can he judge the world? I mean, we'd have a sliding scale of God's righteousness that's forever moving according to the forever moving level of mankind's unrighteousness. Essentially, Paul is saying that the notion that God's faithfulness must be demonstrated by mankind's unfaithfulness is absurd. That's what he's saying. And he goes on to give an example of this absurdity in verse 7. There he says, just to make it quick, I'll paraphrase. If I lie, and by means of me being a liar, this elevates God's righteousness. Remember that sliding scale? And by my lying, God therefore receives even more acclaim and honor. 
then why should I get punished as a sinner for making God even more glorious by my lying? Is that some warped logic? But that's what he's arguing against. That's exactly what the verse says. And he says, <laughs> no. I mean, he's saying, say, isn't it advantageous to God then for me to sin? And you know what? Since the more I sin, the more glory he gets. Isn't this a good deal? I mean, I hope you're seeing why this standard theological doctrine that indeed our unrighteousness is meant to highlight God's righteousness simply can't be so. And that doctrine pretty much has to ignore everything Paul says in verses 7 and 8. Because in verse 8, Paul then takes such faulty reasoning to its logical conclusion. He says that if the straw man's suggestion was really true, then what else is a good Jew to do in response but to say, okay, then let us do evil so that good can come from it. In fact, apparently, this same doctrine of God's righteousness being established according to humanity's unrighteousness, which much of Christianity has held on to for centuries, is what many Jews held to in Paul's day. And so he says that even though as Jews we certainly don't think or say to one another, let's do, do evil so that good can come from it, in fact, the Jews are accused by Gentiles of believing that due to their tradition that man's unrighteousness establishes God's righteousness. You know, when you think these things through sometimes, some of these doctrines, it gets a little weird. I want to pause to say this. Our Christian doctrines are vitally important. Vitally important. They're not just important, though, to what we believe, but also to how we are perceived by the unsaved world. In scripture we find that God is always concerned with the worldly perception of us, his worshipers, because it reflects on him. And when we don't bother to think through some of these doctrines that we casually tell others that we believe in, so they should too, when we don't examine where they logically lead or ask where they came from, it can only relegate us to living a deception. But it can also make us appear anywhere from mean to irrational to the world. And thus, it makes God look mean and irrational to the world. What we just examined is a perfect example of this. Well, in verse 9, Paul expands on this argument with this straw man. He says, so, with all this in light, are we Jews better off? Now, notice, first of all, that Paul says, we are. Jews. To those who think Paul has converted and thus become a Christian, which at all times referred to a Gentile, this is yet another proof. He did not. He is a Jewish believer in Yeshua, not a Christian. I'm going to paraphrase Paul's question. In light of believing Jews having an advantage over believing Gentiles in every way, does that make us, Jews, better off than our Gentile brothers in Christ? To which Paul answers the straw man, not entirely. So this modifies his answer to then what advantage has the Jew when he said that the advantage was much in every way. Much in every way, but not entirely. There are limitations. And that limitation is that in the end, a Jew is as much a slave to sin as a Gentile. Thus, any thought of inherent Jewish superiority 
over, gen, over Gentiles, inferior Gentiles, that was never God's intention. It's not his viewpoint. What advantage Jews have is contained in the fact that God has given them the honor of having his laws and commandments in their midst and in having a set apart land and that special protection and guidance of God. So while the Jews do have God's Torah to show them what sin is and it isn't, the Torah, the law, does not have the power to change people's lives. The law does not have the power to break the stranglehold that sin has upon people. All people, including Jews. Further, no matter how hard a Jew might try to obey the law, God is going to judge each person, Jew and Gentile, impartially based on what? What they do. We've been reading this ever since the first words of Romans. What they do. So even though trying not to sin, when a Jew inevitably sins, he's as much liable to God's wrath as a Gentile who doesn't have the law, and he sins. Now to back up his premise that Jews are no better off in this respect than Gentiles, he begins to list several Bible passages, then he weaves them together to form a logical thread. Verses 10 through 12 are from Psalms 14, 1 through 3, and 53, 1 through 3. Verse 13 is Psalms 510 and 140, verse 4. So, verse 14 is Psalm 10, 7. Verse 15 through 17 is Isaiah 59, 7 and 8, Proverbs 1, 16. Verse 18 is Psalm 36, 2. The flow is that no one is righteous or kind. Righteous unto God, kind unto his fellow man. So no one is adhering to the two God principles that undergird the entire Torah. Love your God with all your heart, soul, and mind, and love your neighbor as yourself. Further, everyone sins, if not by deed, certainly by their words. What comes up out of their throats exits from their mouths. And everyone has evil in their lifestyle rather than only good, even if they may think otherwise. I mean, I can't tell you the number of people I've spoken to who will not give their life to Messiah, but do firmly believe they're going to heaven. You know why? Because they think they are basically good people. Therefore, they just don't feel the need to be saved from their sins because they see no sin in their lives. Or, even though they may sin, it's just small sins. And on balance... Their good outweighs their bad. And finally, Paul says that there is not sufficient fear of the Lord within people. Thus, they don't have enough wisdom to see themselves as they really are. Now, obviously, Paul is not suggesting that all people have sinned in exactly the same way or even level of seriousness. But rather it is that among these sins, all have succumbed to one or more. Now, let me stop here to say that this is the point at which many commentaries say that it was not ever and it is not currently possible to obey all of God's laws and commandments. Thus, the law from its inception was a faulty covenant. I disagree. Ideally, it is possible to obey everything in the Torah. See, the problem for humanity is that from a practical point of view, our 
evil inclinations are simply too powerfully developed for us to fully overcome them. From a technical standpoint, we can obey all of God's moral laws. And in fact, during the thousand year reign of Christ, we will. He's going to rule us with an iron rod. Deuteronomy 30, 11 through 14. For this command which I'm giving you today is not too hard for you. It is not beyond your reach. It isn't in the sky so that you need to ask, who will go up to the sky for us to bring it to us and make us hear it so that we can obey it? Likewise, it isn't beyond the sea so that you need to ask, well, who will cross the sea for us, bring it to us and make us hear it so that we can obey it? On the contrary, the word is very close to you, in your mouth, even in your heart. Therefore, you can do it. Did God lie to Israel or to mankind? Or was this just kind of a hyperbolic heavenly cheerleading to obey the law at all the time knowing it was simply not possible? Of course not. Obedience to the law is possible and expected for Israel and all who join themselves to Israel. Well, verse 19 is kind of a summary. It's meant to hammer home the point that whether living within the law, Jews, or living, apart, living as part of the non-Jewish world, Gentiles, everyone deserves God's wrath. Every, the words, every mouth being stopped is meant to depict a defendant in a courtroom who's been pleading his case. But the evidence against him, against him is now so overwhelming, he has nothing left to say. He is guilty as charged. There is no doubt. He knows that nothing is left but the verdict and the punishment, so he goes silent. Now recall that chapter 3 is being aimed very much at Jews because Jews in this era sincerely believed that simply being a Jew exempted them from God's judgment and wrath. And if that is the case, then they have a little need for the gospel. The Gentile who believes he lives a good and moral life and the Jew who believes that his fortunate heritage immunizes him from God's wrath are in the greatest danger. This is sort of Paul's version of that TV crime show called Scared Straight. This is where youthful offenders are taken to an adult penitentiary and given a taste of what true prison life is like. Hopefully they'll leave so scared and shaken that they'll change their ways and never wind up there for real. Well, then we come to the powerful verse 20. Here Paul states just what the purpose of the law is and what it is not. First, he says, no one will be righteous. Remember, I use that now, righteous. I don't say justified anymore. But you can plug justified in if that helps you. No one will be righteous by God as a result of obeying the law. Or in Christianese, no one will be justified by God as a result of obedience to the law. What's the logical conclusion from that? Why do the law? Because, says Paul, the law shows us what sin is. To do the law is to do right. To not do the law is to sin. The law reveals just how high that standard is in order for us by our own deeds to achieve heavenly justification. And even that isn't sufficient because in addition to all else, our underlying attitude as to why we do the law matters. The, the, these words, for in his sight no one alive will be considered righteous, this is taken from a psalm of David, Psalm 143. In verses 1 and 2 we read, 
Adonai, hear my prayer. Listen to my pleas for mercy. In your faithfulness, answer me. In your righteousness, don't bring your servant to trial, since in your sight no one alive would be considered righteous. So you see, a thousand years before Christ, King David knew that there is no one alive who can be considered righteous based on their works and deeds. Because of our fallen natures, because of our evil inclinations and the impossible circumstances of this corrupt world all around us, God's standard of righteousness cannot be met by any normal human being. King David had the law of Moses. And he grasped that while obedience to the law was always the right thing to do, the law was not created in order to manufacture self-righteousness. Well, then verses 21 and 22 bring Paul's listeners a solution for what up to now has been the unsolvable problem. Everyone in the world, without exception, is going to be judged. If doing the law will not be enough to forego judgment, and if sincerely trying to live a good moral life won't be enough to forego judgment, then what hope, what hope does anybody have? Paul's answer, there is only one hope. And it is expressed in only one way. And that way does not come from doing the Torah. And yet, it is in full conformance to the Torah. And that way is, we must be righteous by God. And we will be righteous justified if we trust Messiah Yeshua now there's an important theological distinction to be made here many Bible versions read or many doctrines interpret the Bible to say that it is our faith in Messiah that saves us that is our salvation is more or less dependent on our level of faith the more faith we have, the better our chances, not only of salvation, but of achieving God's favor in, in other ways. That's not what this passage says. Rather it is that we are, if we are to be righteous, if we are to be justified by God, we must place our trust in Messiah's own faithfulness. Messiah's faithfulness was and is perfect. Biblically, you see, faithfulness is always about being obedient to God and to his covenants. So to be unfaithful is to break a commandment or a term of a covenant. To be unfaithful is just another way of saying to sin. Our human faithfulness will always be flawed, if not intermittent. If we have to rely on our faith for salvation, we're in trouble, folks. I can trust, but still not have sufficient faith to be perfectly obedient to God. Our faith will be sufficient. For some circumstances but not for others so in lieu of our faith we are instructed to trust in Christ's faith if we trust in him God will substitute Yeshua's perfect faithfulness for our imperfect faith that is the picture that the sacrificial system in the law of Moses paints for us. See, animals that are 100% sinless 
and thus can be said in Bible speak to have perfect faithfulness, can be substituted for our human lives that are so full of sin and unfaithfulness. And God in his grace will deem that animal as paying the ransom price for atoning for our sins. But atonement for sins is one thing. Being gifted with a saving righteousness, that's another thing. Christ provides for both, yet he is not the one who actually bestows righteousness upon us. The Father is the one who reaches down to righteous us, to justify us as a free gift. Now later on in Romans, Paul makes a statement about Yeshua's faithfulness that we really must take just a moment to examine. In Romans 10.4, don't go there, in Romans 10.4, we read this. Now, I'm going to use the King James Version because it's just a lot more familiar to our ears. There it says, For Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone that believeth. Now, I know what that probably sounds like to you. Because this verse is the source of much church doctrine that says Christ has ended the law for everyone who believes in him. That is, we transition, if you would, from trust in the law to trust in Christ. That's not what it says. In fact, it falls perfectly in line with what we have been studying when we properly understand the simple meaning of the word end, which is telos in Greek. Listen to what the Greek dictionary says that telos means. A telos is an end or a purpose in a fairly constrained sense used by philosophers such as Aristotle. It is the root of the term teleology, roughly the study of purposiveness or the study of objects with a view to their aims, their purposes, or their intentions. Oh my! So this doesn't mean end as an end of the world. It doesn't mean end like an end of the road. It doesn't mean end of the sense that something's over and done. That's not what this Greek word even means. It's not even an option. Telos means it's the purpose, it's the goal. Now let's reread this verse, adding the word purpose. For Christ is the purpose or the goal of the law for righteousness to everyone who believes. Wow, that changes things a little bit. So the law is meant to lead us to Christ. Christ is the goal of the law. He is the one that provides a way for us to attain righteousness provided we believe in him. It's anything but meaning that Christ has done away with the law. Now in verse 21, Paul makes a statement that even though the Torah doesn't provide the righteousness that we need, it is a witness to it. That is, the Holy Scripture in Paul's day, that meant only the Old Testament, presents the plan of God's redemption. Listen to Jeremiah 23, verses 5 and 6. The days are coming, says Adonai, when I will raise a righteous branch for David. He will reign as king, as king and succeed. He will do what is just and right in the land. In his days, Judah will be saved. Israel will live in safety. And the name given to him will be Adonai Tzidkenu. Adonai God, our righteousness. God, our righteousness. Paul continues the theme that rolls over into verse 23. So that since it is God who gives us righteousness, and since this occurs apart from the law, then this way to achieve righteousness, 
applies to Jews and Gentiles. Why? Why is that true? Because all humanity is in the same leaky boat. We've all sinned, Jew and Gentile. We all come up short of being able to earn God's praise, Jew and Gentile. Paul's next thought in verse 24 is the center, it's the focus of his entire theology. It is that this righteousness that comes from God comes freely to the one who receives it, freely. And yet, there is a cost, but we don't pay it. Messiah paid that cost through his act, his deed of permitting himself to be a sacrifice and a curse in our stead. I think it's important in Seed of Abraham Torah class to always realize this amazing reality. That although we obey God by doing the biblical feasts, eating biblically kosher, observing the Sabbath, none of this is our righteousness. None of it. Christ is the vehicle of our righteousness, and then God, the Father, freely gives us that righteousness through Him. Christ is the agent of that righteousness. But I would also like to embrace something that is going to gain more and more importance as the years go by. The release of the findings of the Dead Sea Scrolls shows the close connection between the theology of the New Testament and the theology of the Essenes who developed their theology from a careful study of the Holy Scriptures, the Tanakh, the Old Testament. So we're going to close today with a short reading from the Dead Sea Scrolls from what is called the Community Document, scroll number 1QS. It's beautiful, it's poignant, and it is the truth that we all need to hear. So listen closely, please. For to God belongs my righteousness and the perfection of my way and the uprightness of my heart is in his hand by his righteousness are my rebellions blotted out for God's truth is the rock of my steps and his power is the stay of my right hand and from the fount of his righteousness comes my righteousness the fountain of righteousness, the reservoir of power, the dwelling place of glory are denied to the assembly of flesh. But God has given those things as an everlasting possession to those whom he has chosen. For is a man the master of his way? No. Mankind cannot establish their steps, for their righteousness belongs to God. From his hand comes perfection of the way. And if I stagger, God's mercies are my salvation forever. And if I stumble because of the sin of the flesh, my righteousness is in the righteousness of God, which exists forever. He has caused me to approach by his mercy and by his favors, he will bring my righteousness. He has righteous me by his true justice. And by his immense goodness, he will pardon my iniquities. Right there is a wonderful way to express the gospel. The essence seemed to have it absolutely figured out. Everything except that Yeshua was Messiah. Everything except that trust in Him is how they had to obtain this righteousness from God that they knew they had to have. We'll finish up chapter 3 next week, get into chapter 4.